I've been buying things on eBay again that are a black hole of time, and I really shouldn't be spending time working on this. But it may be useful in the future for demonstrating or explaining enterprise concepts. 24 100 gig ports on our H242 four node AMD Epic cluster. This is a gigabyte chassis. And yes, we will be able to transfer our Proxmox virtual machines between nodes at 10 gigabytes per second with this setup. This is sort of the ultimate in high speed inter-node communication in a cluster. But the clickbait title is 24 100 gig ports for under $300. There, there's a catch. Actually, there's quite a lot of catches. Intel Omnipath. The technology that you, you know, I, it's, uh, it's the token ring of our age. All right, I've already immediately lost about half of you. I don't know. Token ring is a forgotten technology. In the beginning, there was ethernet and token ring, networking technologies. I'm sure that you've heard of ethernet. In the beginning, there was, well, it was like one or two megabit actually, but it really took off at 10 megabit. And we started to have some architectural problems with ethernet. IBM's design was token ring. And Intel today is kind of like the IBM in the token ring era. It's really interesting, the parallels. But this is a 24 slash 48 port Omnipath switch from HP Enterprise. This was about a $50,000 piece of equipment. Just this one I'm holding in my hands. Uh, like five years ago, six, seven years ago, something like that. Omnipath is an Intel interconnect technology for extremely high performance computers. I don't want to call it a network technology because it's not really just for networks. At its lowest level, it's something called a message passing interface, which if you, if you worked on clusters or high speed computers, MPI or message passing interface uh, is something that comes up there. You can use it for networking, but really it is just a very low latency, very high speed interconnect. And there's actually a version of this on modern Xeons, the little tab, some of the Xeon CPUs that have the extra tab where something connects there. Some of the stuff refers to it as Omnipath, although it's not exactly the same. Actually, the history of Omnipath is really interesting. Fast forward to now, you just wanna make some stuff go. So this switch actually gives us 24 100 gig ports and 24 25 gig ports. And for what I'm gonna do, probably not even gonna use the 25 gig ports because on a modern platform, these 100 gig interfaces like this, this is called QSFP, quad small flat package. That's not right, but it's four channels, but it's all muxed into a single LC, this type of connector is called LC, fiber optic connection. And these are really cheap color chip 100 gig. These are designed for like near data center. And so they have very low output power. You can get versions of these that are designed to send signal kilometers down fiber optic line. And these, those are pretty cheap on eBay too. Don't accidentally buy one of those and then use it with a three foot fiber cable. You will blow out the receiver on the other end. You have to get attenuators and fiber optic network connections or fiber optic interconnects are not plug and play even remotely. Even like 25 and 100 gig connections like this, if you just plug a 25 gig connection into a 100 gig thing, it's not going to link up. It's not at all like Ethernet where it's all backward compatible. By the time something like this gets distilled down into something else that we would call Ethernet, all of those issues have been worked out. Whereas when you're running this, even if you're running the version of this that actually is Ethernet, they don't even necessarily agree on things like forward error correction. If you follow the level one forums and other content, you know, Mellanox Connect X4 and Connect X5, mixing those in a Dell environment, it doesn't even agree on forward error correction. You have to log into the switch and set the FEC mode. Otherwise, you're not gonna get a connection on a Mellanox Connect X4 on a Dell 100 gig switch, which is a whole other story. It, it, this is not compatible with any of that. If you wanna use these, this thing, which is Omnipath, you're also gonna have to use an Omnipath host adapter. So you're not gonna run your internet over this, at least you shouldn't, because the message sizes here are not even really close to the size of ethernet frames. But what this does give us a nice convenient thing to do is to be able to connect machines that are running something like say Proxmox. You can run a Proxmox cluster and have a 100 gigabit connection between the machines that are in your Proxmox cluster. This adapter at 100 gigabits is also typically about $20 on eBay, especially if you're going to buy 
a lot of them. And this isn't even all of them. So all told, all of this stuff on my desk is probably $100,000, $150,000 of equipment. Some of it has its history dating to 2016, but like this OmniPath adapter was manufactured in, looks like June of 2019, or at least it got a sticker in June of 2019, which isn't really that old. 100 gigabit, but again, not ethernet and not compatible with anything else. This is closer to InfiniBand than ethernet. InfiniBand, if you're not familiar with it, is another low level interface protocol. Microsoft sort of famously uses it on Azure. And as a result of that, if you have a Windows based network and you're using InfiniBand for your backhaul stuff for storage and remote NVMe and remote PCIe devices, it works exceptionally well for that because Microsoft has sort of had to dog food InfiniBand and so that works really well. You see that with machine learning solutions, some of what NVIDIA has deployed. The whole reason that NVIDIA bought Mellanox, who developed all of this, OmniPath was poised to really take over the universe. but you know, I, I got into it a little bit in the history side, but it, well, spoiler alert, it didn't. The modern version of this is uh, Cornelius, I think is how you pronounce that. It's a UK company. And the original, you know, person from Intel has sort of moved there. And they do have a roadmap for PCIe 4 and 5 adapters and other sorts of stuff. And there is a lot to like in OmniPath, but it's never really taken off outside of needing something for a supercomputer. That's kind of what you get into sometimes with a supercomputer. It's like, okay, if, we, if we're going to sell the supercomputer to somebody for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, we're going to need stuff that doesn't exist yet. What do we invent? Well, we're going to have to invent a bunch of stuff and then commercialize it. And something went catastrophically wrong for Intel commercializing OmniPath. Because it's not super awful, and I don't even know that I know enough about it to really critique it. But it seems to me one of the mistakes made was that these interface cards just don't have enough intelligence. They pass messages, and they pass messages with extremely low latency, and the reason they're able to pass messages with extremely low latency is because they don't do any computation at all. They just sort of are here. They seem to rely on the fabric for things like security, because you can do security, you can isolate machines, you can say this machine's not allowed to talk to that machine. So uh, there's some nice quality of life things there that may have been bleeding edge in 2015 or 2016 when this was designed, but in 2023, it doesn't seem like the platform has really been updated for that. This thing debuted at 100 gigabit, and as far as I can tell, for the stuff that's hitting a used market, uh, it's still pretty much all 100 gigabit. That tells me that probably like the 200 and 400 gig stuff that's in the roadmap for OmniPath hasn't been manufactured anywhere near the quantity of the older 100 gigabit stuff because you know HP Enterprise is still selling a card that looks exactly like this a lot of the time you know if you look at the Intel X550 for example you know it's just a 10 gigabit bog standard ethernet card the early versions of that had a large chip with a large heatsink and then modern versions of that have a small chip with a small heatsink and that's not really happened with this at all in fact this this looks more like an FPGA than something that has really actually been mass produced but judging by the absolute flood of these that hit ebay uh there's a lot of people upgrading to something else so interesting times now in terms of oh my gosh run out and buy stuff that you're able to get running at 100 gigabit no would not recommend that this is probably a waste of time and money but omnipath was something really interesting um in university and uh, you know at the high performance supercomputing center and Hewlett Packard certainly made a lot of money selling OmniPath stuff to enterprise customers and I've never really gone hands on with it. So this is a rack that I'm setting up to be able to have a place to do testing for open source projects and other stuff that we're working on behind the scenes and also so that I can connect with smart people that have projects to do videos on them maybe. It hasn't really panned out a lot so far, I mean, we did the uh, the project, the Lowell Observatory, which I need to do a revisit or an upgrade or something with that. But, you know, we've helped some students in the Level 1 forums that are working on their PhDs. We've, we've helped uh, some of the people that are working on multi-threading with Rust and the programming language. And I haven't really been able to turn some of that work into videos yet, but I'm working on it. And I've got access to really high-end Xeon hardware and access to really high-end, you know, AMD Epic hardware and 
bringing me along on the journey and being able to learn and sort of live vicariously through their projects has been really, really interesting. Now, when I actually got to set these up, it turned out to be a little easier than I expected because I did a dry run of this on another standalone system and I thought I was going to have to log into the Cornelius website and now nah, Debian's got you covered as it turns out. It's older versions as is the case with Debian, but first is getting your cards physically installed. It's pretty easy. You need to take airflow into consideration. If you've got a modified desktop case that you're using as a server, you're gonna definitely have to add cooling because these things get kind of warm. You also maybe need to worry about IOMMU groups and PCIe Gen 4. A lot of the time these cards are not detected in our 2U2 node gigabyte chassis on a cold boot. On a warm boot, meaning that the system boots up and I just reboot it, it's fine. They're pretty consistently connected. But they're not always actually detected as a PCIe device when the system starts cold. And I think that's actually because the system boots up before uh, the card is really finished initializing because the card itself seems to take a long time to actually initialize. I'd also explain some comments that you'll probably see around the internet, which is, oh my gosh, Omnipath, blah, 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 CPU tab. Okay, so this is the confusing part. Omnipath, when we're, we're talking about like Skylake and Cascade Lake generation, server processors have that extra tab on the processor that I was mentioning before that give you an Omnipath connection. And that's just one half of the equation. These adapters provide a physical interface, but that connection on the processor lets you effectively bypass the motherboard. You see, it's even lower latency and it works even better if you have processors in different chassis that can talk to one another when you're building a supercomputer. And Omnipath is one physical transport that they use to do that. How we're using Omnipath here, it's basically like a glorified network connection. It's really not a network connection under the hood. We're just putting network-like things on top of it and sending it down the line. This is not a lot different than networking over Thunderbolt, where Thunderbolt is not really a network protocol. There's the lower levels of the stack are completely different. The lower levels of the stack here are also completely different. And with that come a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of CPU overhead. Near as I can tell, these are rock dumb simple cards, like I said before, and you will incur some CPU usage penalties. Doing some testing with our eight core Epic Milan, which are very, very fast. Probably the fastest 4.1 gigahertz out of the box single core performance you can get. Great for a storage server because of that insanely high single thread speed if you don't have a ton of clients, which, you know, when it's not a ton of clients on the network, it's totally okay. Then yeah, this processor makes a lot of sense. But with these older Omnipath cards, you have to run so many queues in parallel to get the full 100 gigabit bandwidth that mwah, they really struggle even with their 4.1 gigahertz clocks. At the complete opposite end of the spectrum, the other processor that's in our gigabyte cluster here, 7713, those processors, 64 cores, even though they're the, not the highest clock Milan processors you can get, it works like a champ with these. Ah, oh, you want a 24 wide, you know, queue pool where there's 24 queues going out at 100 gigabit? Yeah, no problem. Out of the box performance, you should be able to achieve about 30 gigabit, give or take, but with some tuning, you can get closer to like 70, 80, 90 gigabit. So that's gonna be important that you shove this in an X16 slot to get the full X16 bandwidth because PCIe 3 by 16 is only about 16.5 gigabytes per second. And you really can achieve 12, 13 gigabytes per second on these cards because they're so low overhead. The Proxmox setup, <laughs> apt install some packages. That's in the guide. Then check and see if you got the interface. If you do, from there, you're good to go. You can do everything else through the Proxmox GUI. Log into the GUI, we probably should restart the node just to make sure that everything comes up as it should once you apt install those packages. Oh, and as an aside, it does seem like you can throw these cards into some kind of an ethernet mode where you could connect them to a 100 gigabit ethernet switch, but experimenting with the Dell S5212FON running the Sonic firmware because and Dell wants a license for their firmware, which is a conversation for another day. Uh, I couldn't get it to link. I tried all the different forward error correction modes. I tried everything else, even creating the, you know, doing the virtual ethernet thing, which is not bundled with Debian, by the way. You have to go download some random forgotten stuff from somewhere else. And it'll try to set up a, an ethernet, but I, I don't think that's really, it, did, it, did, it didn't work with the Dell switch. It pretty much only works cable to cable. You can directly cable these or into an Omnipath switch. On one of the nodes, just pick one, create a cluster. And then on the other nodes, log in and go join cluster and then paste the information from the first node. That's it. That's just the standard 
way that you do that for creating a cluster with Proxmox. Then you can create some virtual machines and migrate them between nodes. Even though I don't have shared storage set up yet, it's really insanely fast migrating virtual machines between local storage on each of the nodes. <laughs> Probably because it's, you know, 30 gigabit without even trying. And yeah, you can get over 10 gigabytes per second with a little bit of tuning and if your host CPUs are fast enough and you've got it in the right PCIe slot. Now for storage, you must be thinking, well, what are we gonna do for storage? 45 drives, I've got the 45 drives chassis. We're gonna put an, an Intel OmniPath card in the 45 drives chassis, and guess what? It's still Linux under the hood. The Cornelius website actually has RPMs for Red Hat and Red Hat derivative distros, which is what 45 drives use, so you actually have a little easier time getting newer software working on the 45 drives chassis. Boom, it's ready to go for Omnipath. You assign an IP address and then iSCSI, NFS, anything that you wanna export from your 45 drive systems work here. This is kind of mind blowing that you can get this level of performance from cast off enterprise kit for about $300 without really jumping through a lot of hoops to get it working. Not something I recommend for production workloads, or at least if you're gonna do it for production workloads, you should have a backup plan like 10 gig ethernet or something in case all of this mysteriously stops working because it's older gear, it does run kind of hot and it does, it does do funny things sometimes. I used Alien, uh, which lets you import RPMs into Debian on one of my Proxmox nodes to see if I could run uh, some of the newer message passing stuff and some of the more higher end accoutrement with the uh, Omnipath NIC and it works, but mostly you don't need to. And so unless you're a really advanced user, you probably don't need to go down that path. So there you go, that's a quick rundown of Omnipath. And can you use it on Linux and Proxmox? Basically, yes, with some caveats. Can you use it with literally anything else? No, <laughs> not really. I wanna run this on Windows. No, <laughs> ain't happening, sorry. Well, I mean, okay, it could, it could happen a little bit, but that, that Java-based control program, if your switch is not, your Omnipath switch is not set up the way that you need, <laughs> Ooh, it's not gonna be fun. I'm Wendell, this is level one. Check out the forums at forum.level1text. I'm signing out and you can find me there.